Uh, good morning and welcome to the Scottish Parliament and to this uh, session of our Festival of Politics programme. I'm, I'm Jackson Carlo, MSP. I'm the uh, Conservative MSP for Eastwood and also, more appositely, the convener of the Citizen Participation and Public Petitions Committee uh, here in the Scottish Parliament. And uh, I, I very proudly believe that the public petitions uh, process that we have here is, is probably one of the best of any parliament anywhere. Uh, and moreover, we are just about to publish our own report on participative democracy, deliberative democracy and, and public participation in politics, which we'll be doing on the other side of the uh, summer recess. Uh, so this is um, the 19th year of the Festival of Politics. Uh, I'm told here it's been provoking, inspiring and informing, which I, I hope we'll be able to uh, do today. People of all ages and, and, and from everywhere. So uh, I, I hope you're all truly representative of, of Scotland and views. And you'll be getting an opportunity a little later on in our, our session to contribute your thoughts, either um, those that you have on the issue generally or things that have been stimulated by anything our panellists have had to say or, or questions that you would, you would like to put as a result. And so we're delighted that you're participating in this activism uh, Vote For Me panel, uh, which is in partnership with the Scottish Youth Parliament. Uh, and if you're keen and are following this either in the room or are following it where we are live streaming at the moment on the Parliament's uh, SPTV channel, uh, if there are any thoughts you want to contribute in the meantime, before we move to questions later on, then please do using at visit Scott Parle or on Instagram. So I'm really pleased to, to be able to introduce our panel now uh, to you. We have got Erin Waldy, Dr Jan Eichhorn and Molly McGoran, MSYP. Now, Erin is a member of the Young Women's Movement's advisory panel and a recent graduate from the University of Dundee with an MA in International Relations and Politics. Uh, she's also a volunteering uh, girl guider and as a speak out champion and spokesman, as well as taking part in the young women's movement, young women lead in Dundee and empower projects, empower trustees programme. Erin, welcome. And how on earth did you get involved in all of that? Um, when I was 17, I got involved with Girl Guiding Scotland, which um, gave me the opportunity to go to the House of Lords. And As a member? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> I got to go to the House of Lords and shadow um, a Baroness for a day. Um, and Which Baroness were you shadowing? Well, Benjamin. Well, well, well that would so be quite interesting. It just stemmed from there, and that kind of inspired me to apply for politics at the University of Dundee. And then I got involved with young women's movement from in Dundee with Young Women Lead. And uh, I think I was trying to establish uh, how many people are involved in all of that? I mean, what is the kind of it, the, the structure in which you operate? So the advisory panel essentially advises staff on what we want to see in the movement. Um, so recently I advised them on how the rebrand would go, um, how, what, essentially what text, what, if the rebrand is suitable for what we want, um, help advise on what we want to see in reports, so. Great, well sit back and relax and we'll come to you. <laughs> Next to you we've got Dr Jan Icon, who's a senior lecturer in social policy at the University of Edinburgh. And the main area of his work is the political engagement of young people. He's conducted research on this in the UK and Germany and led several projects investigating the impact of the lowering of the voting age to 16 in Scotland. And Jan also coordinates work in this field internationally and often contributes to policy and media debates too. Uh, and Jan, I, I, I was intrigued to ask you, uh, because I'm, you know, all you academic types, um, as to what on earth is actually social policy? It's, uh, and I keep hearing about these, I'm charge of social policy, and after, what on earth is that? I have to admit, my parents keep asking me that too, <laughs> um, uh, still. Um, social policy is quite an old discipline in the UK, and it's, it's, it emerged basically as the study of the UK welfare state, but has expanded since, and for us really means basically applied politics. So what we're interested in is how decisions are made in the political process, including people who influence the process from outside the institutions, and then how it affects society, the economy, and so on. So it's, for me, was always really attractive because it's very interdisciplinary, and I used to be a student activist in Germany, and 
became really interested in studying these things and realized um, you need multiple perspectives to understand them. So that's why I feel very much at home in, in social policy. I'm none the wiser, but uh, <laughs> fair enough. And next to you, we, we have uh, Molly McGoran, MSYP, uh, who is the chair currently of the Scottish Youth Parliament. Is that a two year thing you do that for? One year. Or one year. Yeah. Is it just a one year term or a two year term and you get one year as chair? Yeah. And, and you are the MSYP for Inverness and Nairn and has obviously been an advocate, because it's the biggest shot there, for rural connectivity uh, and women's rights with their social media campaign, Girls Just Want to Be Safe. Uh, as a former convener of the Transport, Environment and Rural Affairs Committee, she campaigned passionately for climate justice and concessionary transport. And she's also a full-time Scots law student at the University of Dundee. Uh, and I've had uh, MSYPs have come through my office as interns and uh, have some gone on to abandon politics, some gone on to be researchers, some gone on to be elected politicians themselves. So what motivated you to get involved and which of those three do you fancy yourself? Oh, I couldn't say that. <laughs> we need to finish the last year at uni first and then we'll figure that out. Um, but yeah, I got involved. Um, I was really lucky to come from such a beautiful village in the Highlands where um, youth work is a fundamental part of our education system as well. It's really ingrained. So from the time that I was in second year, I was able to volunteer in my local community and be the change that I wanted to see there. And then someone mentioned the Highland Youth Parliament to me. So I got involved in that. And then someone mentioned the Scottish Youth Parliament to me and I got involved in that. And I've been here for four years now so it's been quite a journey I've managed to do every single role within SYP and I've worked my way up so very happy to be taken on time this year and did the pandemic it kind of undermine the kind of ability to engage in the way that we would normally see because we, we are used for example to there being a session of the Scottish Youth Parliament here yeah. uh, in the Scottish Parliament and all of that I know was completely under mind by the pandemic? Did it disrupt your ability to kind of operate as you would have hoped? I wouldn't say it undermined. I would say that we had to adapt. We had to become a different version of the Youth Parliament to be able to engage our members and to make change, but just in a different way. Um, I don't know if it was as successful, or maybe it might have been, who knows, but we definitely changed and were able to kind of keep engagement and get more members through the door, so yeah. I'm very and happy. Has, have some of those innovations become embedded into... Because, I mean, I know some of the changes that we had to implement here in the Scottish Parliament have become part of the permanent way in which we operate. Yeah, so we've taken on um, having online sittings, more online events, kind of hybrid um, working as well, as well as little pop-ups in different areas. Rather than bring all of our members to one space, we can have them in different places across the country so there's less travel um, but they're still kind of doing the same things and getting involved in the big kind of community feel. Great. Well. well ladies and gentlemen can I ask you to welcome uh, our three, uh, three guests who are <laughs> contributing. So research from the University of Cambridge looking at faith and democracy found that millennials are the most disillusioned generation in living memory. Do you think that's right? Um, relevant to what? And if so, why? Who wants to... Start with easy questions. All right, okay. <laughs> All right. Is this your field of expertise then? It, yeah, well, we'll let you... It is to some extent. Being the oldest uh, being member the oldest, the panel, yeah, we'll let uh, you start. It, um, <laughs> well, well, except for me, that is. <laughs> <laughs> I... Um, we definitely see, uh, this is not unique to the UK, this is internationally that a lot of young people do have a degree of disillusionment, but this is not, and this is how sometimes it, this gets reported, it's not the same as apathy. Right. Um, and this brings us actually back to a point that actually dissatisfaction with the political apparatus and how democracy works is not necessarily a bad thing. Some of the highest satisfaction ratings with democracy are in authoritarian regimes um, because people report it as, as it's wanted. It's um, an American political scientist once turned to basically the dissatisfied Democrat is actually the best Democrat because they constantly want to evolve. Now, the problem is what you don't want is a total breakdown of trust. We haven't seen that yet, but what we have seen amongst younger generations in a lot of Europe, um, including the UK, is again not apathy, but uh, dissatisfaction with the 
institutions of representative democracy, which is a problem, but a lot of young people have um, actually become engaged in mechanisms outside representative democracy. So it's really important. It is true that we have a decline in some of that institutionalized trust, but actually other forms of engagement come in. So if we can bring it back together, there's actually an opportunity as well. Um, yeah. Okay. Molly? Yeah. No, I completely agree. I think that Another thing that's kind of a contributor to that is maybe the introduction of media as well. It's become a lot more divisive to be involved in politics. It's become increasingly more difficult for younger people to understand and for there to be kind of cohesive information around getting involved in democracy in any sort of shape. And we're seeing a lot more kind of different things that are emerging that nobody really understands to an extent. The divisiveness is something that we've seen quite a lot and it's making young people more passionate about pursuing the other forms of campaigning activism that are outside the traditional kind of scope of democracy, exactly as Jan was saying. They want to campaign, they want to be out on the streets fighting for... It also uh, kind of gives it doesn't mean that people have to vote for a specific party. They can just campaign on the issues that mean the most to them. They don't have to research all of this stuff about a different party to be well informed. They can just campaign on the things that matter to them to kind of make it, take it back to their kind of simple roots. So it's less kind of, it's exactly what you said, it's less uh, disillusion of democracy and more with the kind of current system that's mm. in place. Well, these are themes we can explore, but I'm interested. Uh, I get the impression, and, and, and I'm interested to know your view, that whereas my generation was much more willing to look at the basket of policies within a particular party's political platform and join and embrace that, mm -hmm. um, there is much more now of a, a, a view that, well, I don't actually like that, that and that, so why would I join that? I would much rather campaign on these issues, which are the ones that I am most concerned with. and so. It's become, for a lot of young people, issues that appeal to them that they campaign for, and then they decide how they're going to vote or campaign in an election, but maybe less tribal than I think generations previously would have been. Does that seem to reflect your views as to how people are operating? Yeah, that seems kind of fair. I think that um, young people don't have time we don't have time we have things to do we have a world to kind of we've inherited a world that's on fire we need to focus on the bigger issues first than kind of these politics these party politics that are really kind of disrupting what we want to achieve we want to look at the individual issues that focus on that kind of underpin all of these world issues that are kind of come into the scope of party politics. But we need to focus on the bigger picture first because we don't have time. We're running out of time. Erin, what's your perspective? Um, as a young woman and also inheriting democracy from millennials, as a Gen Z as well, I see my biggest issues like with representation. A lot of young women don't see themselves represented in politics and that can throw people off a lot. So not seeing yourself represented in politics is like, why should I essentially vote if I'm not going to be represented? And even if it's representing a, an area constituency, it's like, well, it's actually in the bigger picture. You're making issues for, in the Scottish Parliament, for Scotland and not just my area. So um, as well as that, it's like, as Molly said, we have bigger issues and a lot of people look at those bigger issues rather than the smaller issues because in my head it's like the smaller issues are irrelevant when our world is on fire or these, there's these big issues that we need to focus on now. So. It's, it's really interesting that a lot of young, young people who start more through that side, that activist side, Often that is a route into formal politics, however, very often um, and quite a lot because there is the point where it's kind of, OK, we need to legislate and, and then some some, you know, not as, you know, an elected person, but working with someone else, for example, running the campaign for them. And so, so you see a lot of that transition. The problem is often the other side as political parties not having adapted. So we've worked with a lot of young people who were really active and two things keep coming up. One is that issue of representation. New report out in Germany again, it's that a lot of young people with migration biographies, which in Germany is nearly 30% of young people, 
but only 5% of elected politicians from the local to the federal level represent people with migration biographies and people who try to become involved actually become rejected. The second thing is the operation of the party. So, as you said, it was a really good example that there's been adaptation. So, you know, you can do things in hybrid settings and young people move around a lot because they have volatile jobs, might have to go to different locations, take a semester abroad. Now, if you look at a lot, not all, but a lot of political party structures, they are built on the local meeting in a particular physical location at a certain time, which becomes difficult if you're a young parent, uh, becomes difficult if you don't have the transport means and so on. So it's kind of, it's, it's that th the willingness to engage is there. The question is, do the structures allow it? So it's often kind of those structural hurdles that, that prevent, I think, from using some yeah. of those opportunities. I mean, I mean, I, I, I mean when I came into politics well, 50 years ago, I mean, the major political parties all had memberships of over a million people. I mean, it, it, they were mass movements. And we'll maybe come to that because it does make me wonder at times when I see much smaller national party memberships now, um, if, if, if that's made everything a bit policy light and lazy in that, that, that parties are coming to policy positions that aren't really rooted in a very, very, m a much wider base of activist support but from a much narrower base of activist support, which leads to a degree of disengagement too. But when you talked about representation, Aaron, were you meaning that people looking physically don't see themselves or don't hear the issues they want to hear discussed, or was it both those I things? I think it's a mix of both. So if you're looking, say, at an MSP and you don't see yourself, you're like, well, and they don't cover the issues you want, especially in like a small area. So for me, for example, I lived in a deprived area um, and it's like, well, am I going to vote for an MP or MSP who's actually going to represent that deprived area and represent me or do I vote for, which probably doesn't exist, and then, or do I vote for an MSP or MP who covers the area as a whole and focuses on, doesn't essentially focus on that. Yeah. I mean, interestingly, this, this is a proportionally elected parliament. Mm -hmm. um, but part of the inquiry we've been doing into deliberative to democracy, we went to Dublin. Uh, they have citizens of panels, uh, parliament of 100 people, and they refer that as Ireland in one room because they have every characteristic of the Irish Republic reflected in the, uh, the, the citizens panel that works. Um, and they themselves say, but the parliament doesn't. And, and then I look at our parliament, even though it's proportionally elected, it probably isn't really... Doesn't, I don't think you could describe our parliament as Scotland in one room. I think, <laughs> I'd certainly say that. There are very few disabled, very few diverse. Very, you know, it's, there's more of a balance in gender now than there was before. But in so many other ways, it still is very removed, I think, from the Scotland you then walk out onto the streets and see. And I wonder, just in terms of that face of politics, there are various parliaments we've now got in the UK. Have any of them actually managed to look and become and seem more representative of, of the country? Or do they all have failings and flaws? And you talked about the whole adaptability, I think, of the uh, infrastructure of democracy, which is just lagging behind, perhaps, the kind of move of people and their willingness to participate. It's definitely better than it was um, in the most recent election. It was the most women that have ever been voted in. Um, obviously, first wheelchair user in the parliament as well. I did some personal research a couple of years ago about women in the UK parliament, and I think at one point there was only eight women of colour. So it's like eight women of colour across 600 constituencies you don't see, it's like, and then sometimes you don't see them in the 600 faces. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you don't really feel represented, even if they are not your constituency. Wow. Yeah, and it, I think that really throws off young people from voting or even participating in politics as a whole, because they're like, well, I can't see me. I can't do that. And that's one reason I got into politics because I want more women in politics to see, for young girls to see oh I can do that because I didn't know I could do it until late high school yeah yeah 
Yeah, you, it's, it's, it's a real problem because how do most people get into parliament through a political party? So it's the it's, it's something where the political party apparatus matters. And most parliaments have significant levels of, of um, uh, non-representation, so to speak. If, um, but you sometimes see improvements. So recently, the German parliament, the federal parliament, for example, the average age went down massively, mostly because the social democrats got uh, basically a quarter of their new members are uh, under the age of 35. But why was that? It's because they made a very concerted effort to recruit young people. They, one of their leading figures, now the general secretary, was the leader of the youth movement who was featured very prominently, and they organized themselves the youth movement, to get young people in who were interested in party politics, but you know, were engaging also if they went abroad for study abroad or so, they could still continue to engage. So they were very successful. Now, in terms of migration biographies, the German parliament is terrible, however, because no party has made the effort to reduce those structural barriers. So one of the really, really important things is how parties deal with it, and we actually see that when political parties reach out to constituencies, especially younger ones, young people pick it up. We saw this in Scotland, then the voting age was lower to 16. After the independence referendum, a lot of young people joined political parties, including not just independent support, the Conservatives gained members amongst young people. Well, right? Don't sound so surprised. <laughs> no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm saying it as a, and that is, that is a good thing, because one thing we need to remember, young people are diverse in their views. There is the entire political spectrum find support amongst young people. But what political parties need to do, um, and a lot of, not all of the parties, but several parties after the referendum did that outreach to this new constituency of young voters. And those parties that did really, really saw an increase in their membership amongst young people. Those parties who didn't, won't name them right now, but it's, some of them did, did much less. And so it's, I think there's a lot on that supply side we sometimes say of politics, kind of how, how much do you adapt? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it's certainly true. I mean, my own party did get quite a lot of young people coming in, which was just as well. Our membership stayed flat because we've so many old members and they were all just dying. Uh, so it, it, kind of kept, it kind of kept the membership level level. Uh, but I found in that 2014 campaign, that was when I was persuaded to accept the idea of uh, lowering the voting age. And we've tried to argue for this with our own party at Westminster because I did that. Because young people were in my experience in the referendum in 2014, the most actively engaged with the issue. When we went round schools, they were really um, engaged and asking detailed questions. Whereas I found, regrettably, many older people in the referendum were still asking me basic questions as we got towards the point where they had to vote because they, they hadn't really done any... They, they were kind of li, still pretty much the tram line of whatever they'd thought before the thing began, whereas young people had gone away and done a lot of research on the actual issues and had ended up on different sides of the argument. So it was quite fascinating to see the, how, how that actually changed. Erin? I definitely think with that as well, it's like, no offence to older people, but you're not going <laughs> to see the change that's actually happening. Young people are going to have to live for it. So I... I guess that's why they did more research. They're going to have to like live with all the different policies that have come with all the different issues. So that's why there was obviously more research done with younger people, but with yeah. older people, it was more basic questions because they might not live as long. So, well, well, every young person will become an older person, yeah. let me tell you. I can testify, testify to that. But I mean, this part was interesting because, Jan, you were talking about. Um, and I'll come to you again in just a second, Molly, but you were talking about uh, how younger members had come into the Parliament. Uh, and I came into this Parliament in 2007, and I tabled a question, and it was how many of the MSPs were over the age of 60 uh, when the Parliament was first elected in 1999, and it was eight. And how many of the MSPs were over 60 when I was elected in 2007, and it was 48. Mm. And, of course, that is a reflection of the fact that if you have a fairly non-politically changing environment, politicians are re-elected and get older, and the average age invariably creeps up. Now, the 2016 Parliament here saw 50 new members out of 129, and I think we had something like 43 new members in 2020. One. So, again, I think the age of this Parliament has, has declined, but, but, but it's a factor of political cycles 
rather so it's by accident rather than by design i think i would say in terms of the way in which young people are able to come into it molly yeah, well, my immediate answer to you, um, is there any parliament that's done that successfully as us, um, the youth parliament? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I completely agree with what um, Jan was saying is because we are a completely party A political organisation, it's so much easier for us to focus on the things that matter to us. Party politics does become so divisive, especially when there's so many issues on the table. And I, I completely see your point of like older people they just have, they're voting for what they know. They don't want too much change. However, young people, we're all about change. We all want change because we're not seeing the stuff that we need out of this world and the parliament isn't giving it to us, I think is what. Um, but we're definitely on the right track. We have done so much amazing work with politicians, MSPs in UK and Scotland, um, abroad in Geneva, um, and with like at home in the Parliament uh, engagement team. They reach out and they do such amazing work with a all variety of people that have encouraged engagement in parliamentary systems, in public petitions committee, in um, the assemblies, just reaching out to people, that's how you engage with them. And even if down the line, you, or even if initially you don't see yourself represented down the line, if we continue on with these kind of engagement strategies, then we will see it, because it is really deflating not seeing yourself represented, it's almost a disrespect. They, why should I represent a parliament that doesn't respect my views if they're not championing, championing the person that I am? It's, it's quite difficult to not see yourself, especially as a young woman, in that political sphere. But any time you do, it's terrifying. It's, it's absolutely terrifying to be a woman in politics, and we have spoken about this so much because it doesn't get any easier. We'll keep talking about it when it does, until it does get easier, but... It's quite difficult, um, and making the, this change diverse is just kind of the first step. Well, let's touch then on a point that you've just raised. Um, that's one that Jan raised I want to come back to as well, but you, you touched there on how difficult and corrosive and divisive yes. it is. Uh, I sit in the Scottish Parliament's corporate body, uh, and since the uh, murder of Sir David Amos, we've obviously had to look at the security of... Uh, all uh, of our uh, all of our colleagues, and um, some of the things you know that not a matter of public record, but some of the things we've had to do uh, to protect the domestic addresses of some of uh, my female colleagues here in the Parliament are quite shocking. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. and it's not something I've personally experienced, but I, I can see that it, it seems to be yeah. very much something that is focused heavily on uh, female participants in the political process and yeah. it's incredibly ugly and I think for those of us who don't necessarily, there will be male colleagues of mine who won't have seen what I've seen, I mean, who would be deeply shocked I think if they actually saw how far that has gone. What has stimulated that? I mean I, the last 10, I mean the iPad only came into being in 2010, the whole social media kind of uh, political sort of cyber war if you want to call it, what, what has led to that uh, do you feel Erin uh, and uh, Molly. Molly, do you want to kick off or something? Come to yeah, um, I feel like it, it's quite a, well, it's a huge question that you just posed, but no, it's, it is terrifying some of the stuff that the female politicians have to go through. Um, myself and Sophie, the previous chair, we did an interview off the back of um, the allegations that came in about Angela Rayner. I've spoken to other female politicians who have to wear an alarm round their neck. There's only three of them and they're all women, um, just in case someone breaks into their home or starts attacking them. It's so scary. Um, the Social media definitely hasn't helped. It's not. It's not to blame at all. Um, it's it, not entirely to blame. It's the people that use it that are kind of making it as divisive and as horrible as it is. Um, but it is being used as a tool to kind of spread that rhetoric um, against women. We've seen so many people become popularised because they're reinstating all these masculine beliefs, but they're actually uh, just kind of finding a way to channel their kind of underlying heat. It, it's quite, it's a really difficult issue to kind of summarise into a cohesive thing, because if you wanted to talk about feminist issues, I could be here for years. Yeah. Um, we but would never you, shut up. But Molly, have you found people are determined to defy that 
uh, pressure that they find them under? Or have, have you experienced of, of, of those who said, look, this is, more than, this is just more than I'm prepared to put up? Um, yeah, well, m myself, I, I love, like, I love being a young woman in this, in this time, in this period. And like all of the campaigning stuff that I do, like Girls Just Want to Be Safe, is about making life just in general, more safe for young women as they go about their business, um, just going about their daily life. I am very proud to have started the um, SYP's Women Empowerment Programme, um, which was, we allowed our members to kind of speak to their experiences of um, being young women in politics, engaging with decision makers. And we found that um, even though like internally, we were doing an amazing job at uplifting young women, it was when they went out into the world and were engaging with decision makers that they felt unwelcomed and uncomfortable kind of in those areas so we've been kind of looking into why and delving in a bit deeper as well as making some recommendations for ourselves in the future and to um, the people that we work with parliament and other partners to make young women feel more welcome in those spaces. Yeah. Erin? Um, as Molly said it is absolutely terrifying to be a young woman in politics or a woman in politics in general um, because it put, essentially, when that happens, it also puts young women off going into politics because you're like, I do not want that to happen to me. It's, um, and then when, I definitely agree that social media isn't the cause, but it's definitely a platform that amplifies it because you could, I've experienced this, you post something and then there's a mass of like people just replying to you saying that you're wrong. They, all of the time they comment on your physical body. Um, and then in Parliament, if you're women in Parliament, stuff like assault and all that can be amplified because someone just thinks your opinion's wrong. And like Molly said, people wear an alarm so people don't, don't come into your house. That's amplified because you're representing people and if people don't agree with that, they're going to um, resort to extreme measures. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly corrosive. I mean, I, I, I quite some time ago did a test where I posted something um, and lots of people wrote in and said that was absolute nonsense. So I posted the complete opposite and the same people posted back that that was absolute nonsense as well. So they were just, they were just determined they were going to say whatever you say is absolute nonsense, even if it was the other side of the argument. I mean, from a social policy point of view, Jan, I mean, what, what's your experience of this? I mean, obviously you've got students who are coming through and uh, wh where do you see all of this sitting? Uh, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a really, really fundamental issue because what in the past, uh, I mean, so as, as the millennial kind of yeah uh, it's the um in the past uh, i remember when i started in student activism and some of those issues came up this was kind of the early 2000s basically and the focus was very much on saying as an individual this is what you can do better basically and um, we're now fortunately shifting to that other side and looking no actually it's the structures we need to make sure the structures that are in place engage with this and provide this because if we don't then certain groups will not be represented as much, not because they're not interested, motivated, but simply because there are those barriers. In Germany, we did a very extensive project led by my colleague Jan Jadege, which um, looked at the participation of um, people with migration biographies, which is a very big group in Germany, massively underrepresented. And one of the key findings that came through was not that the motivation to engage was lower, which was usually what it said, we need to kind of have campaigns that motivate people. That's nonsense, that's, that's not the problem. It was a concern, it was representation. The other thing was a concern for real safety mm -hmm. and people concerned about their families. So people who started engaging, there was a really large proportion of people who had tried to get engaged in politics and experienced racism in that case and therefore withdrew sometimes not even out of fear for themselves but for their families and we see this this is a major issue in germany at the moment we see this massively amplified right now in certain constituencies where the far-right afd in germany is is gaining where you know offices of mps are being smashed in in particular of non-white um, members of the german parliament and it's a massive problem because unless we engage with the structurally um, we, you know, will not enable basically people who want to engage to engage. So that shift that I think it's a really important shift over the last 15 years when we talk about the participation of women, people with migration biographies, other groups that are underrepresented. 
But I think we've kind of only gotten there more recently that mm. it's been taken seriously on that structural side. But without that structural response, um, yeah, we are we're not I mean, I mean it. just to, to touch on Germany, I, I was in um, Munich last summer and we visited the Bavarian uh, State Parliament. Uh, and uh, I, I, a very engaging uh, young Green Act uh, elected, Florian, somebody, I can't actually remember his second name, but a, a, a very nice young guy, very, very different, the Greens in uh, Germany, to the Greens here, actually, because they're very pro-entrepreneurial economy and they're very pro-nuclear defence, I mean, and, and defence, quite different. But I felt so sorry for Florian because he looked as if he was in his early 20s, and the rest of the Bavarian Parliament looked to be very old white men. And I could have thought, my God, how on earth do you get through the day in this sort of an environment? I mean, do... I mean, is it often... And let's say we get women elected into parliaments, they get there, and then they look around and they feel in, quite isolated in the parliament itself because they're kind of the only one of their age or anything or interest. And I, 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 does that also have a kind of negative effect on the, of the ability of people to sort of participate in the activism? That they've been keen enough to do it, they then get themselves elected, and unfortunately what they then find when they get there is not what they were hoping it would be. Mm -hmm. I feel like not necessarily representing their, it doesn't necessarily hinder their ability, it, rep, it hinders the opportunities that they could be getting, like connecting with other people and um, socialising and being active and engaging is all a part of the job of a politician. If you find it hard to engage with someone while you're in that door, it's just going to limit the opportunities that you have. I think a lot of the sense of shared camaraderie around women in politics is because often they're the only other women in the room and that's not necessarily a good enough reason to talk to someone but it's sometimes the only reason that you have um, so yeah it just kind of hinders the connections that people could possibly make because also if people are reaching out they could be doing it under a false guise of inclusion or diversity where it's really a checkbox exercise rather than wanting to get to know you or your policies they're seeing you as a diverse individual or as this person that's here to kind of tick that box rather than for your own the value that you're going to add to that area that you're in because they've obviously been represented they've obviously been picked to represent an area in their own right they they have kind of the ability to do so and they're just not getting um, the kind of opportunities to show it. Okay, just, yes. it, I think this is one, it's such an important uh, point, I think, because it's, you know, whatever characteristics people have and represent, they also have other characteristics yeah. and interests, right? Same with young, you said earlier, mm -hmm. also young people want change. That is true. It's one of the reasons why young people are less partisan, because they look well if a different party changes their program, you know, maybe I go for this, and have impact on their parents quite often. It's always mm -hmm. one thing why I say political parties should think about young people. It's where you have much more opportunity to actually engage discourse and so on. But what change young people want varies, right? Mm -hmm. There are young people. So I'll use the German example just uh, again. In the not the last, but the, the federal election before, the most popular party amongst young people was Angela Merkel's Christian Democrats, had a plurality. This time, the two top number ones were the Greens and the, the neoliberals uh, in the German parliament. So there is a lot more fluidity for that reason, and young people are as diverse, right? Young people are not only young people. Mm -hmm. Women are not only women, and yes. you know, people with migration biographies also. So the person I've talked earlier about, one of the German MPs, a uh, young MP who's joined, whose office was smashed is a construction engineer and it's like it's one of his big focus points you know mm -hmm. sustainable concern he says i talk about all these other issues too but you know i don't just want to be seen yeah. for this exactly. so so it's it is kind of a, a, a base to, be, to have others but you have to be an yeah. advocate for your identity without uh, like it's, it's not your sole purpose that's yeah. completely right honestly so it's yeah. really difficult it's something else I, I certainly feel sometimes the political system doesn't help because we appoint people to speak on a particular subject yeah. and then nobody ever asks them ever to express a view on anything other than the particular subject that they've been asked to represent. And so they become pigeonholed in the public mind as being completely polarised on an issue when in fact they've got a far broader uh, range of interests. And you said something quite a while ago that, that struck me just as before we come to uh, questions from the audience. 
And it was this, you know, that everybody says, oh, young people have lost faith in politics and they're sceptical about it. And I think you quite interestingly said, well, actually, why is that a, a bad thing? Uh, is, is being sceptical and not having faith in all the current arrangements not actually as it should be? And is it maybe not as it's always been to a degree and that the agent for change is, in fact, that scepticism? It's... It is, I think, uh, a healthy degree of scepticism is a good thing because otherwise, if we're happy, why would I engage, right? It's a, um, so, but there's one thing that we need to be careful about and we do see this in some countries tipping over the edge and I think this is an issue in the UK, uh, not, not solely, and that is you still need to have the, res the acceptance for the institutions, even if they're run by people who don't agree, we call it in political science, loser's consent, right? If you lose the election, if you're campaigning for something, but it's not there, you still accept that there are people, you know, who are governing, for example, at the moment, but I have the right to challenge them, and I have the right to challenge them in whichever way I see fit. That is healthy. What we're seeing now, however, is that sometimes that legitimacy itself gets questioned. That's the point where it tips over the edge. I don't think we're there in the UK yet, but we do have a minority in the UK that have, dis that have so much dis but across all ages. We, it's higher than it was 20 years ago. The number of people who genuinely think the political system is, is done for me. It's not as bad as in the US. In the US, we are in a position where people genuinely do not accept the legitimacy of political outcomes in big masses and yeah. we see what that results in in germany it's a minority view but one that in certain regions is very strong quite a few of the voters of the afd do not accept the democratic system in the first place so i think overall skepticism is a good thing but it needs to still be within that confines now and i think at the moment i think overall we're still there in the uk but I do think it's something we need to work very hard uh, to maintain. Well, I mean, let me just ask you, before we finally move to the audience. Um, in the 2014 referendum we had here, we had the highest turnout mm -hmm. on voting day in any poll ever held anywhere in the whole of the United Kingdom. And I took that to be because people thought the issue mattered and therefore the outcome wasn't determined and therefore how they vote mattered. Uh, my Eastwood constituency typically has one of the highest turnouts in elections of any seat anywhere in the United Kingdom. Uh, not because they want to get rid of me or support me <laughs> particularly, but because it's a genuine three-way marginal. Mm -hmm. And in the last 15 years, Labour, the SNP and the Conservatives have all won my seat. And therefore, people think, I need to go out and vote because the outcome in this election is not one anybody yet knows. Whereas there are other parliamentary seats where I think maybe people think, there's nothing I'm going to do on polling day that's going to affect the outcome, so I, I won't vote. So is there, a, is there a kind of... And then people think that is representative generally of people's level of activism. And is there a, is there a, a definite need because I'm not sure there is. Activism and people actually voting, voting is terribly important, but I can see there will be people who are very much participative in active uh, democracy, but who don't necessarily think that the outcome of the vote in their own area is going to make much difference. The, the in, I agree with nearly everything you said. Um, it's <laughs> the, um, the, what we do see is, um, you're yeah, absolutely, so two key factors for whether people uh, turn out in elections, referenda and so on is A, do they think the issue is important and B, do they think the election matters in terms of determining the outcome, is there a feeling of efficacy? So absolutely, this, we know closely contested elections have higher turnout and so on, absolutely. When we come out, but there is another dimension to it and that's that activism side, the kind of civic society, the engagement, the sort of thing that you know, youth groups do and so on. And you are right, the two things are not perfectly aligned, but actually what we know is it's kind of nearly the other way around from how you described it. People who become more active outside representative democracy and voting are much more likely to vote. Oh. Because ultimately it's like they see that voting isn't enough for them, they do the other thing. But very few people who do that activism then say, and I won't also cast my vote. It's kind of the other way around. It's one of the things where sometimes skepticism about activism, because it usually challenges the, the status quo, 
But those are the people who are engaged already in many regards. And it's one of the reasons, one of the other reasons why turnout was so high in the Scottish independence referendum. Of course, people thought it was very important and they saw it was contested. But actually, when you look throughout the two years of the campaign, when you ask people how likely are you to participate, it gradually increased. That wasn't a given from the very beginning. And it is overall because those two years from a kind of broader civic point of view, but uh, I'm not making a judgment here on which side is right. But overall, I would describe the Scottish independence referendum campaign with some exceptions, but overall as a positive civic process yes. because the engagement we saw, I mean, people were interested in academics like me. Mm. We were asked constantly to go into town halls, <laughs> to go into schools, to engage politicians, engage young people, organizations, organize so many things. Both sides could speak in the campaign as well. There were exceptions where yeah, something turned up, but overall, compared to what normal election campaigns look like now, it was an incredibly civically engaged process. And that is the other factor that's often ignored. When there is healthy civic debate that stretches beyond what's happening in Parliament, people also become more engaged usually with representative democracy. And that, that is again that challenge, I think, that I would put in particular to political parties and people in power is it is totally fine to say things happen through the representative mechanism, but don't see that activism outside as competition to you. See it as an opportunity to engage with people who you might otherwise not be able to speak to. That, that is, I think, one of the, the really important challenges. And a word in this area from both of you, Erin. I think with party politics as well, if you have an MSP who is more likely to engage in that activism, young people are more likely to vote for them because they're like, I saw that person there, they support my cause, I'm more likely to vote for them. I live in one of the only Labour constituencies in the UK Parliament in Scotland. So at the last general election, it was one of, I think... And you live in Edinburgh? Yeah. So we can work it out. Edinburgh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it was... Um, and how is he in Murray? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> but um, the last election, I think, was one of the closest ever because a lot of young... It was my first general election, so my year was, like, first general election of, like, oh, because my... It's been a lot better in education, learning that we have to vote. It's in PSE curriculums. But with the activism point, um, with young people who are more likely to vote if they're involved in activism, it's because it gives you an opportunity to learn more about politics, how it works. Because if you're involved in it, you're more likely to go and research, and that involves in party politics. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think okay. that's where I would actually go as well. Um, I think the, the reason that... The, the very simple reason that the highest turnout was for the referendum is because it was a very simple question, yes or no. Um, <laughs> you're not looking into all of these polls, like, the, the, you're not voting for a party, you're not voting for a person, you're voting for an idea in a, in a sense. There is people behind the movements on both sides, however, it's very, well, obviously not a very simple decision, but uh, it's boiled down to a simple phrasing of yes or no. Sometimes party politics tends to hide behind kind of confusing wording or difficult policies that are um, not designed to engage with everyone. But I think that that was a very um, distilled conversation which allowed for more engagement in that way. And as you were saying, engagement from everyone across Scotland. Everyone wanted to know... Um, Everyone wanted to be involved in campaigning, either yes or no. It was quite a simple reason. But um, kind of distilling that, those decisions down to that kind of base level is an easy way to get people involved in politics. Activism, it ties into that perfectly because it is the issue distilled down to the base level. They're not campaigning for people to take it forward. They're not looking for parties. They're not looking for anything. They're looking for a specific issue and they're campaigning on its behalf which is why it just makes it, in my mind, it's a lot more simpler than voting for a party when you have to understand all these different things. And it, exactly as Erin said, activism allows you to become more educated about these different, um, what parties support your issues, what different people think. Um, like I wouldn't have known half the stuff about who, to, who I wanted to vote for, or who um, represents the things that I believe in until I got involved in volunteering and activism and campaigning in the youth parliament. I would have absolutely no idea. So I've been quite lucky in that sense that I've had the, the reach out to me and I have had the kind of reach out back yeah. um, to be able to be involved. Yeah, yes, Aaron, please. Okay. 
Molly mentioning like the yes or no question. I only got taught how to vote in the additional member system, which I completely agree with, but it's very complicated for people who are in their first election. I only got taught it in modern studies, which is a subject you had to choose. So a lot of young people don't understand it and their vote doesn't actually get counted because they'll do the same as the first pass to post system and put an X when you actually have to rank them. It's not really taught in schools, so that puts a lot of young people off voting, mm. or even if they do vote, it's not counted. Okay. So. I mean, interesting, I mean, the societal shift is that uh, politics was banned as a, as a topic for conversation in schools when I was there. I mean, it just it wasn't allowed. Uh, and now it is very much an active base. And, and I was, I mean, two things in my own constituents recently. I mean, the, the turnout in Eastwood in the uh, referendum was, I think, 93%. Um, and, I, I mean, when I was younger, we used to laugh when the Politburo in the Soviet Union talked about turnouts of 93%, because we used to say, aye, right. But, so, I mean, it was extraordinary to see that level of engagement. But I was also struck speaking to um, St Ninian's High School in uh, East Renfrewshire, 250 senior pupils, who asked me a series of questions at the end, and I said, is there a final question? And, and, and at the end of it, the, the senior people stood up and said, yeah, I'd like to ask why you are conservative, because you don't seem to agree with anything your party's actually doing. <laughs> and I think that um, that is often misunderstood, that within political parties, all of them, um, we kind of end up there, but that doesn't mean that we have signed, or that anybody has signed up to the whole agenda of, of a party, which over decades can move quite sharply within the parameters of that one party to quite different positions on different things. And you can find you're in fashion with a particular party who's an out of it, uh, but still actively involved in it. Yeah, which is very easy to see from inside the house, but from outside it's not quite that simple. Yeah, yeah. With young people, they're more left while they're young and then they grow up and they become, it's research that they become more right-winged or right on the political scale. So it's like a lot of young people begin there and then they shift just like political parties across. Well, I will live in hope because I taught my <laughs> sons to be independent. One of them is a vegan Corbynite. So I, <laughs> I will hope that you're right. Um, now, we're going to come to, to you and the other. Obviously, I, I hope you've enjoyed the conversation and we're not restricted to that. Uh, but, we'd, you know, if you've got contributions you'd like to, or questions you'd like to put, or themes you'd like us to explore, we'd be very happy to do that. So if you can tell us who you are, uh, and a microphone will come to you, so don't rush into it till the microphone does. And when the microphone comes, tell us who you are and then put your point. And forgive me, I might occasionally take two or three points just at once if, in order to ensure that we cover as many people in the uh, 35 minutes or so that we've got to do this. So this gentleman here, I'll come to you first. You were fastest with the hand, I think. Hey, thank you. My name is Bryce Goodall. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. I'm a neurodivergent, neurodiverse interim Rainbow Greens representative on the Scottish Greens membership committee. Um, I just wanted to maybe go into two bits, especially as somebody who's got autism uh, and just it myself, is accessibility into politics. Because basically we're seeing political parties um, go using the same websites and sign-ups, then moving to like app-based membership systems or using like, like Google, Google or using Apple Pay to try and be able to take collect membership dues and also looking at accessible actions on apps, um, especially for like a rural and hiring activist who may not be able to travel into into real life um, in IRL like actions. And basically I just wanted to find out more about that, about what your opinion is about that and do you think we should really be speaking plain English inside the parliament? Because the thing is this, so we're talking, I think think that from what I've seen through politics is it's the people who have, who, because I take a lot of words to come to my point because I, I would say I'm not very well educated. Um, I'm, I've only went to sc school and I think when you have people who can both say some, some words in shorter, shorter words but use big language, it can really be quite... Um, quite scary to, to see that they're getting more platformed than people who are disabled and neurodiverse and neurodivergent. And moving on to, like, for example, with, with, in my role with Rainbow Greens, um, and also trying, to, and also as neurodivergent as well, as we've seen, like, for example, Lorna Slater 
been absolutely attacked on social media due to, due, due to the deposit return scheme and the trans siblings being absolutely attacked online through the Gender Recognition Reform Bill um, that's been going through, going through the courts at the moment. And the thing is this, so do we think we need social media companies um, to really step up and really, really, be, really be there? For example, do, do we need a verification body where basically we, we make sure that we know who is actually interacting with people? Because we've seen, for example, an app which, have, which was about to become big in this country was called Clubhouse. And we've seen like the safety of women, um, there were even a house called the safety of women on Clubhouse where women have felt just so scared to take part in like social audio apps, stuff like that, is that, that could we, how do we actually really fundamentally support and how, and how can also um, young boys and men, especially in politics, how can we show up as allies? How can we show up as accomplices? How can we do things better in politics? How can, how can we navigate that? Because I mean, I remember not, I've been remember when I was removed from sex and relationships education from school lawfully. And uh, because the thing is, this was, was, was autistic. How can we help to, how, how can we help to support okay. people with that? Thank you very much. All right. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, well, quite a basket of issues there. Uh, and one of them that struck me, and obviously there are the accessibility issues that were raised, but of course the whole way in which we talked to this earlier, social media interacts and, and how corrosive it is. And I suppose the, it's a two-part question in addition to the wider response. In principle, should there be some sort of uh, regulation of social media content and in practice, how on earth would that, and I think that has been the difficulty for everyone, how would that operate? Because who, who would decide what was uh, regarded as being um, inappropriate and, and corrosive? Jan, have you got a, a view on yeah. that? And the, the, the accessibility issues, because we, there's quite an, a proactive um, focus on autism and the issues in relation to its impact on participation and generally in life. Uh, within the Parliament just now, and uh, the, uh, we, the, the, there was a cross-party group meeting just recently with uh, recommendations that went to the Minister that are currently being considered. But yeah. it's, it's, it's a really, really important issue, and it, actually the two issues are, are connected, I would say. The, the first point is, to me, absolutely regulation. The only way, however, how regulation works, because we, you won't be able to have a um, kind of a government oversight of every uh, message that is posted, is to put the responsibility onto the companies themselves. It's actually through the sort of things, you know, we, we place very high burdens of safety standards in construction companies and so on. You can place a similar burden on theoretically a social media company and they then have the responsibility to figure it out and if they don't could lose a license to operate type thing. Um, so would, would they the, not just the, become a default that they wouldn't allow anything to be posted because that was the safest thing to do? They probably wouldn't because that would destroy their business model because then they can't target people with advertisements. So it's complicated, but the most um, promising suggestions that I have seen on this is genuinely to get those companies to basically think about. They, they can invest into certain types of technology. They did it before when certain types of content uh, needed to be moderated. They hired people to do this and so on. They, it, but the burden needs to be with them to come up with the solution ultimately, but they need to be mandated, otherwise they lose the revenue streams. I think this is the thing, and it best works obviously if multiple countries operate in a similar way and, and generate that bigger burden. Should, should they the allow thing. people to participate on social media anonymously, as so many absolutely do? Because yeah. it's the anonymous contributions that are very often the most vicious. Uh, it, it, uh, and you can't track down who they are, where they're from, or anything. And then when you look to see how many followers they've got, it's like 16 or something yeah. like that. But they've been allowed to be really, really pejoratively unpleasant. I think the ability to operate anonymously is very important because it's a safe space as well for people, for example, with certain you know, sexual identities and so on to operate not under their clear name, for example. So I think that's possible. But should they have the ability to know who it is behind? Does there need to be a background verification? For so there are complicated debates around this, but I think we can do it. But the responsibility needs to be in a space. But there's a second dimension, which comes back to what Aaron was saying earlier around 
education, because this has become a part, we've done research on this in Germany, the number one source through which young people see political information is through social media channels. Now, some of that is from other outlets. So young people find often through social media BBC content that's produced through social media. So it's not all influencer stuff, you know, it's like this is broader. But the channel is there, it's happening. So again, there's that education thing. It's one of the things that we've done in our research on votes at 16 in Scotland. The number one thing where we didn't hunt, a lot of good things happened, there's a positive long-term effect on turnout. But one thing hasn't been achieved and that is that all young people in Scotland have the same opportunity to harness that opportunity of voting earlier because how political education is done varies massively by local authority. In the referendum, um, there were local authorities that allowed hustings in schools and all research says you can do this as long as it's balanced, there's, you know, teaching class. Do it. Go, go engaged as long as it's balanced and neutral. But there were local authorities where they said basically you're not allowed to talk about the referendum in school. And that inequality still persists in Scotland. We do not have a uniform approach to civic education, which is a big, big problem. My, the third final point that relates back to this, and I think it has to do with this education knowledge side as well, um, to the point on accessibility and plain English, using plain English in political debates. Now, sometimes, yes, in a committee, something will be very, very technical and technical. That's fine. But especially when we see the sort of bigger conversation, the discussions in the chamber, it really matters because political parties, this was, Molly, you were talking about this earlier as well. It's not just that they sometimes come across as, you know, a bit vague and kind of difficult to grasp. It's sometimes a strategy. This was Angela Merkel was incredibly successful with a strategy of what they called asymmetric demobilization. In other words, basically being so vague that the other side becomes bored, um, effectively. I mean, this, this is in well, a nutshell, plain English. The, that's this, every day here in Hollywood. <laughs> and, and it worked. It worked. It was not that they gained new voters, but they basically got the other side to become totally disinterested. And it's, it's a really, really important point that that sort of plain language, clear engagement ability is something that we call out when it's not there and are able to detect. So I think those three issues are actually connected quite strongly. Molly? Yeah. Um, and I don't want to lose sight of some of the specific points that, that no, were being made. I, I, that's why I've, I've been making some notes. So I've been keeping, keeping track. Yeah, I completely agree with the, the, well, all of what you've just touched on. But the last point really specifically um, about accessibility into politics is something that we've really tried to improve in ourselves as an organisation and kind of challenge others to do the same. We've kind of taken a listening, learning and an adapting approach with listening to people's lived experiences, learning from what they had to say and what works best for them in kind of all of these different spheres of accessibility, neurodiversity, um, just the way that different people engage with material and how what, what we put out there, what content we put out, um, how we engage with young people to change and then adapt to become the best versions of ourselves going forward. Um, accessibility is a really big thing. I, you touched on um, about um, being rural, and so that's something that I am very familiar with as being from just north of Inverness. Um, yeah, it's, it was quite difficult to become initially involved, but again, I was really lucky, as I said at the start, to um, have that kind of youth work base that gave me the more fundamental, like more fundamentals than my education system did. Like Aaron was saying, that modern studies is a necessity. We didn't have it. We were in a really deprived rural area. We didn't have modern studies teachers. We hardly had history. We d we did with what we had, and I'm very lucky to have ended up where I actually am. Um, but the, yeah, the I think something that can kind of underpin all of this is just kind of having an intersectionality to all of these issues is knowing that um, one of these things doesn't mean you like what we were touching on earlier like one of these things doesn't mean that you are just one of these things the barriers to kind of engagement are intersectional there's a whole different host of things that go into people engaging with activism democracy and politics and more widely um, yeah and then just kind of challenging others to be to make their spaces more accessible as well is something that we've tried to do and we've tried to bring into our activism as well. Erin? I think I wanted to touch on the point of Jan saying about background checks as well. And if you put it to like an intersexual view, it's a lot harder for especially trans youth mm -hmm. if they're using a different name online for safety reasons or that's the name they go by and they have to provide ID. Obviously it doesn't colorate and they might get banned. 
for me personally, a lot of abuse that I have received is off X, is it? Yeah. Twitter? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is a very, the way it's going right now, we don't know what's happening. We don't know if it'll ever be background checked. It's a very wishy-washy way to go. Um, with young men and boys, I think the best thing to do is just listen to your peers and yeah. listen to young women who want to go into politics. I think that's the thing I've always said to like my peers, just, 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 just listen. Mm. Um, bring, unfortunately, in the society that we have, a lot of young men are going to have a bigger voice than young women. And if you raise those issues and be like, well, actually, someone I know, and then bring that someone you know up into it as well, um, giving the focus on the young woman herself. So. OK, I'm going to ask this. We'll take maybe a couple of questions. So can I see hands up again, just so I've got an idea? So we'll take one here, and then we'll take the gentleman here at the end of this row next. Okay. You used the phrase... We've can, sorry, can you say who you are again? <coughs> just remind us again. Um, my name's Adela. I'm 26 years old. You used the phrase, we've inherited a world on fire. Could the panel discuss the how decades of climate change activism and an insufficiently urgent response from world governments will have affected people's disillusionment with general politics? OK, so that's interesting. And we'll take this question at the same time. Hi, everyone. I'm Jack. I'm 21. I'm a student at the University of Glasgow, and I'm also a former member of the Scottish Youth Parliament. I wanted to ask about kind of the changing image of activism and tie into both what Molly said about the media and Jan, what you've said about uh, civic education, for example, in modern studies. Um, when I was going through modern studies in high school, um, the main image of activism that we got um, for those who did take modern studies was a, it's a very dated example, but the Fathers for Justice protests. Um, I presume that example has now changed probably to just stop oil, as those are the main group gaining traction right now. And a lot of young people are kind of seeing activism as protest signs causing disruption um, and the media hating you effectively. So do you think the presentation of activism is causing further disillusionment? And what can be done to change that? OK, I think we better unpack those two issues because they were quite separate. So if we start off first with the whole way in which I think particularly younger people have embraced the whole international debate about climate and their focus on whether or not that, uh, pro that, uh, that whole debate and the resolutions required to take it forward are being properly addressed and are in themselves feeding activism or feeding disillusionment. Molly, do you want to...? Well, it's funny that you say that because I think these issues are very much interlinked. Uh, what Jack was saying is it very much ties into the fabulous question about climate change and the way that governments are going forward with it. I, um, I've changed that, that bio from the start of studying Scots Law and Energy, so I'm very passionate about climate change and I've done so much stuff on campaigning around it specifically. Um, one of the things that I've been lucky enough to do um, in my time at SYP was attend um, COI 16, which is the youth version of COP26. And I remember um, fundamentally, like as a base, um, we had such an amazing time of speaking to other young activists from all across the world, their journeys, how they're working in their own country and different things that they were doing. But um, the thing that stuck with me the most about the conference was actually an interview that I did afterwards. Um, because at the time that COP26 was happening, there was also so many protests in the street of young people going out and shouting for things that they believe in. And I had an interview with a journalist who asked me, do you think that these people are giving what you do and uh, your form of activism a bad name? It's like, absolutely not. They're very much interlinked. The people from the inside the house would not have the voice that they do from the, if it wasn't for the people outside. The people outside are giving us a platform, not even outside, that's a terrible way to put it, and I can't phrase it any better than that because I was physically in the building. Um, <laughs> I, it was the people that are out there on the streets, the grassroots activism that gives the people um, like me, the kind of representatives of the Youth Parliament the, or just any activist body, the opportunity to kind of have our voices heard at these top levels. They give us that base, that foundation. Activism is changing. 
the way that it's coming across is different for everyone, but the way that it's becoming an unstoppable tidal wave is just so impressive. It's sweeping up everyone that wants to be involved, everyone that's never felt like they had a voice can come together and get behind, especially climate change. There's nobody that wants to live in a world that's on fire. There's no one on this planet. And we see it as young people are such a, it's such a simple issue to us as do all these different things, but there's so many different policy strains that come into it. It's such a difficult issue to navigate. So it's about kind of taking those two strains of the way that activism is phrased to make it more palatable for the people that are making the, these big decisions, but also making the people that make these decisions kind of simplifying and taking it back to a baseline where people that do activism are happy with the results of a sense. They're, they're feeling a sense of accomplishment and I'm feeling a sense of accomplishment for being able to echo their voices at this high level that something is being done. I don't know if I want to personally speak on whether enough is being done because then we'll just go into a whole different rabbit hole. Um, but yeah. Okay, Erin? Again, those questions are definitely interlinked because it was the whole point of the Fridays for Change was seen as bad because children were missing education and that was bringing like, a spotlight to climate change. So it was painted as bad, but the way it was actually taken, it's done a lot more than I think anyone ever expected it to do. Um, activism as a whole, especially with like protests and all that, I think it's a lot of traditional media who see it as bad and how it's, especially like newspapers, TVs, a lot of people just pick out the bad bits of it as well and when it's actually a lot of good, it's a community who wants something to change and it only really gets that bad when we aren't seeing that change. We feel like we have to do something that bad for it to get attention and then that brings it to the point of especially with climate change it came that bad because people weren't doing anything and then that brought another spotlight to it and be like oh we have to actually change something I think, I think that it's a um it's, it's a really important point because, yes, obviously the debate about the climate crisis, is, it's not new, right? It's like when I was in school in the 90s, I learned about the greenhouse uh, gas effect and so on. I remember people, people are calling this out. It's not, it's not a new thing, of course. I think where the biggest frustration comes, so I, I work, one of my projects where I work on is where we're looking at the, the kind of um, understandings, um, also the economic understandings of, of the climate crisis in multiple countries. And one of the things that struck me when we talked to um, long-standing campaigners and kind of big international organizations like Greenpeace and so on as well, was that they were saying the biggest disillusionment and so on, and I think that, that does reverberate then with views on the political system, was that effectively, yes, the issue is now on the agenda, but it's sometimes still seen as another topic as if kind of it's not a topic that is actually connecting into pretty much nearly every realm of, of our engagement. So the a key frustration um, that, that I think came out was that it's not become structural enough in view but individual. I mean one of the things that often gets called out a few years ago Greenpeace even changed their position on actually what we first need to talk is our political and economic system because I mean everyone knows the the personal carbon footprint which is a concept BP developed with other, um, obviously, fossil fuel companies because it shifts the focus on individual responsibility. Now, we should all take individual responsibility, but even if everyone lives more sustainable individually tomorrow, we have not gained that much because of the bigger structural things of how do we produce our energy and so on. I'm sure most people know that in the room, but it's one of those really important things to bring us back to this question. Is politics able to engage with things at the level it needs to be engaged with? At that point, then, people disagree on the solution. Some young people believe more in technology. Others think technology is kind of a, a fig leaf kind of thing and so on. And we have different views. That's why young people are in different political parties, even if they care about the climate crisis. <laughs> but it's, it's that question, is it being looked at structurally? So I, I think that is how 
quite a bit of that frustration comes in, is kind of that question, can politics engage? And it brings us back because it is a structural point, that civic education point. And so on. By the way, there's been really great empirical research last year that looks at if you have more extreme form of protests, I'll use this as a neutral term extreme, but like kind of if we use just stop oil and so on now, it doesn't actually affect public opinion overall negatively because what typically happened, it legitimizes the, the form of demonstration that's become more mainstream. So Fridays for Future is now seen suddenly as the kind of nice part and so on. So it's kind of, it shifts things into the debate and it also allows different young people, for example, to participate in different forms of protest. Some young people would not like that form but would engage in a different way and so on. But the, on the school point, the final point, I think it's, it's really important. I don't want to blame in particular the teachers in Scotland because they're modern studies teachers, history teachers. They do tremendous work and sometimes are really, there's a great project at the University of Glasgow that was done at the Stevenson Institute. They show a lot of teachers are really, they really want to do it, but they're also worried of being criticized. We've talked earlier, right? This kind of, are you influenced? All research says this is not a problem. There's occasionally a tiny story, but overall, teachers are incredibly responsible. And sometimes I would say maybe even too responsible. <laughs> but, um, but overall, it's a really, really important thing to have those debates. But because people are really careful, it's how much do you engage with a variety of activisms? Is, is a really big thing. What sort of teaching materials are available if it's not mainstreamed? That's the other thing. And then there's a third thing, and we've seen the best civic payoff from civic education is when schools themselves are places that allow for democratic engagement. Um, fantastic project by the city of Vienna where young people in schools actually do a citizen's budget in their district. So representatives from each school get together, there's a certain budget set aside, young people determine things, they have to vote on it, they don't get everything they want, they have to go back into their schools, convince people's proposals get, get voted on, and those things get implemented with city planners. So the key thing is, it's not just what is taught, but also that question, do schools allow? Because what you see when those things happen, then also young, some people like very much the formal process, whereas others are going to protest their fellow students because they don't like how they do it. So even within schools, we can show that there are varieties of forms of political engagement. And, and when that happens, it usually only has positive effects, none of the negative things people are afraid of. So I think it's really important, but, but there is this question of do we just teach it or do we also practice it in, in the educational context? I mean, that's such a... Can, I'll throw in a, my observation as an ageing politician uh, was that I grew up in an era, I think, when there were far more in-depth interviews with senior politicians where what they meant by a slogan was teased out and understood. And when political discussion programmes on television were issue-based in detail, Whereas now they tend to be question time type formats where in Scotland it seems to me everything comes back to the constitution in response to almost a question about anything else. And so that politi political parties, it seems to me, now embrace issues and march people up the hill, say on the climate agenda or the green agenda, and people fall in behind supporting them only for those politicians never to actually have articulated specifically what they were planning to subsequently do, so that I think some of the disillusionment that might have been expressed there is because once the politicians are in power, they think, oh, well, oh, we didn't actually necessarily mean that, but nor do they go back and properly explain to people why or why not they're then going to take something forward. So there's a sense that, well, you sounded as if you were really engaged in this mm -hmm. issue and wanted to take it forward. You then get into power and, well, you haven't done anything about it. And when we ask you why you've not done anything about it, you answer by telling us the answer to a question we didn't ask at all. And that whole kind of corruption of the debate seems to me to have helped fuel my disillusion to some extent at the other end of my political career to the one I came into where I felt there was much more of a testing of an argument than I see now, despite the fact there is far more politics and politics on available to watch now than there was when I was younger. But I learned more watching it when I was younger than I do now. Am, am, am I wrong? I mean, what's your analysis I, of all of that? I, I think there are two things from my perspective too. One is, I do think one thing that has gotten better, but it's not there yet, 
is that there's been improvement in the variety of voices that get to talk about politics. So a great thing that happened around the referendum was the BBC's Generation 2014 panel. 16, 17 year olds all over Scotland selected to be diverse, being brought into mainstream programming. That's a good thing. I agree with the second point, though, about a lot of also virtue signaling from um, certain politicians and so on, and after the elections it goes. Empirically, what we, what, it's, no one likes to lose, but if you lose an election, for example, or a vote or a campaign and it doesn't get implemented, but you understand why it didn't, it was realized you can regroup and so on, especially if you get feedback and, and things, that doesn't have to be negative. It's much worse if you win and then uh, you had massive hopes and nothing of that happens. And this is sometimes, of course, you, uh, politics can be compromises. In Germany, we're used to coalitions all the time. So compromise, very difficult for parties to, to deal with that. But it's also parties that change their view. It's, it's, I mean, I take um, an example from the UK. It's the same in Canada. Um, liberals in Canada, Labour in the UK in 1997 come into power saying we're going to change the electoral system and not doing it. Um, okay, it changed to the House of Lords, but right, the, the Blair administration said they would change the electoral system. They didn't do it. Now, those are some of the worst things you can do, and it's particularly poignant to, to young people, because if, if, especially because young people are often recruited by parties as the campaigners, as the ones who are willing to go out, as willing to do stuff. And if then there's no follow through, that creates a much bigger disillusionment than a loss. Um, and so it's, um, so I, I share some of those points, but I do think there's one positive side I would say is that we have seen a greater variety of voices than, than in the past who could okay. talk about things. Uh, can I come back to you? Because uh, if the microphone, you asked the question, uh, how would you have answered your, this lady over here, how would you have answered your own que question in terms of um, the uh, disillusionment I think you saw between uh, what's said and what's done? Um, I think what you said, well, what both of you said about politicians say, oh, we're going to do this, but then it's just not done to the extent that people thought it was going to be done. Like, they think it's been treated as the big priority, world on fire, that we think it's going to be, and it hasn't been. And you mentioned you learned about greenhouse gases when you were a child. When I was a child, we learned about how polar bears are going to get extinct, and this generation of children are hearing about how people are going to lose their homes and entire islands will be lost. So we've heard about it for a long time. It's getting worse, and you just don't see the level of urgency in response. So I can understand someone thinking, oh, well, like, we've talked and we've talked and they're not listening, so there's no point, which is obviously an oversimplistic and defeatist way to view it, but it is understandable why some people would feel that way. Yeah. And, and can we come back to this gentleman as well? Just to, what's your response to your own proposition? Um, I think a lot of the responsibility comes down to the media, um, personally. Um, I think it's very clear that um, wanting to shut down kind of protest as and delegitimize it effectively is um, a really big issue now, and social media is absolutely not helping either. Um, I think, as um, you mentioned, Jan, with um, groups like Fridays for Future gaining legitimacy as a result of arguably more extreme groups like Just Stop Oil, like that can only be a positive. And with events like uh, COYE um, in Glasgow for COP as well, giving young people that sort of platform. And then you're seeing um, young people take these pos take positions, for example, um, with the UN and with SYP's recent um, excursion to Geneva for the, the UN Children's Rights Committee. Just kind of focusing on what I would say is more like insider activism or kind of like more palatable activism is probably the best way to kind of give it legitimacy, I would say, um, even though it's absolutely important to report on the other side of the coin as well. Excellent. Okay, well, let's have one last round of questions. So can I see those who would still like to ask a question? We've got two at the front. We've got a last encouragement round the room so that you haven't missed your chance. So we've got one here and we've got two here. So we'll start with the one there and we'll bring all three of you in at this point. So just remind us again who you are and then ask, make your point or ask your question. Uh, hi, I'm Bethany Iveson, a member of Scottish Youth Parliament for Clydesdale. <clears throat> um, my pronouns are she, they, and I'd just like to ask like, the panellists, it's a really basic question, but I think it's really important, what kind of words of wisdom or advice do you have for young people who are wanting to enter politics but maybe don't have the confidence or um, the kind of courage to advocate for things that they care about? OK, and, and we'll take these two questions as well so that we can then 
pull all the contributions together. I'm Rachel. I'm the member of the Scottish Youth Parliament for Edinburgh Northern Leith, and I use she, her pronouns. I think one of the sort of key themes or trends that we notice when we're engaging with decision makers is that they will approach us with their agenda. So they will approach us with issues that they've deemed a priority or that they've deemed important. And this is even the case for sort of committees or groups that are designed to serve young people. But we often find that we identify different priorities or that the priorities that they come to us with, we haven't seen as a massive issue. We don't find to be young people's priorities. So how can we ensure that there are more opportunities for young people to direct engagement, to set the agenda, sort of to approach the decision makers themselves and say, look, these are our priorities. Now can you engage with us? And finally. Thank you. Um, I'm Marcus Looker. Um, I'm also a member of the Scottish Youth Parliament. I represent Angus South and I'm very proud to do so. Um, and I just want to pick up on some of the points that Molly was making, but was also kind of touched upon around education. Um, to talk a bit about like youth work. Um, so Molly talked about the role of good youth work and getting her involved in politics. Um, the area that I represent in Angus has seen significant cuts to our local authority youth work. Um, and so I'll give you an example. So I recently did some outreach in Brecon, which is a town in North Angus. And I was talking about, I talking to two girls and I said to them, so what do you do? Like, what do you do at the weekend? And they said, nothing. Why is that? Because there's nothing to do. No one ever tells us what's on offer. No one gives us an opportunity to get involved in our community. There's a town in North Angus as well, Kitty Muir, um, which has prided itself on its community activism. It has um, like this thing called Kitty Connections. and All the people in the town get involved except the young people, because they're never invited in. It's exactly what Rachel was talking about. When young people then are, are then looking to get involved with um, opportunities of activism or of community, their issues are not then reflected. When they bring up issues, they're told, mm, but that's not what we're hearing, or that's not my ex um, understanding of the situation. We're told that our version of events is wrong, um, or, or not, you know, not what the adults are talking about. So my kind of question then is about, about youth work. What is the role of good youth work and good youth voice and participation in upskilling young people so that when they're in the room, they can do exactly what Rachel was saying about getting their issues onto the agenda? Great, thank you. Well, we've got about a minute apiece for each of you in the time available, so you might like to pick an issue out of the basket of questions we got there. Erin, can I come to you? So I originally got involved in politics through girl guiding, so youth work is a lot. I think a lot of people don't realise as well, a lot of the adults are volunteers. They don't get paid for their time, but I think the good way to get younger people involved in youth work and politics for the adults themselves is to look at channels from broader spectrums. I think my opportunity for the House of Lords came from my leader looking on the Girl Guiding Instagram saying, oh, everyone would be interested in that and then sending it to me. So it's mostly just look at, try ask a girl, even Girl Guiding, try ask your girls what they're interested in or try go around the community and ask what they're interested in. Even if it is volunteering and it can't happen every week, but I think it's just a good implement to start I, obviously, I don't have experience in more like rural, rural places and more like widespread areas because I live in a city um, and I've always lived in cities, so it's very much. But I lived in a more deprived area of the city, and it's obviously again people don't get paid for it. But asking them to say, "I'm interested in this. If you see anything on official channels, can you let me know, or can you let the community know?" Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's not word of, words of wisdom, I, I wouldn't claim uh, that much, but what I would say, it's the flip side kind of, of what we said earlier, I do think if you want to get engaged, don't feel you have to start with the top level kind of big party politics necessarily. Find something that feels right to you, and for some people, by the way, that is parties, you know, people who love that sort of structured approach and so on. Find something that's right for you, because if you find a community through which you can engage, an organization through which you can engage, then they will support you. If, and if that is through an activist route, for example, and you find you have a real passion, but suddenly you have supporters who might you know, support you in getting through this. There are also now initiatives, um, I, I love the name of one in Germany called Brand New Bundestag, uh, which basically <laughs> champions young people who otherwise might not have there are organizations now that try to coach and help and so 
on. So there is actually support for that formal political role, but, but finding that is true. I think just to say on the youth work one, I absolutely agree. I, I talked earlier about the importance of civic education. We see this as one of the dominant gaps still in Scotland to harness even more of the opportunity we have. But it's not only school-based civic education, it's also education outside of school, especially for young people who might have difficulty in school, aren't in school as much and so on. It's, it's one of those areas, it actually doesn't cost that much money compared to other funding pots. Uh, money is always scarce, and so on, but it's incredibly important. And I'm appalled at the moment in Germany that in a context where we see a far-right party in parts of East Germany polling at 30%, that the German government is cutting its democracy fund. Um, it's, it's, so I, 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 I can just agree. And in some cases, there is so much good practice out there, but it needs the money. It is, there is a financial resource question that absolutely comes into it. Thank you. Uh, and Molly? Yeah, I'm going to try and touch on all of the questions. I'd be absolutely remiss if I um, didn't take this opportunity to mention our elections are happening in November. Uh, and you can uh, sign up to become an MSYP uh, on our website. Um, please get involved. <laughs> but no, this is one amazing way to get involved in activism uh, for members all across the country. We really pride ourselves on being able to upskill young people in a way that empowers them to be their best selves going forward. But generally it can, as exactly as Jan say, find something you're interested in and follow it. It doesn't need to be party politics, it doesn't need to be this, it can genuinely be anything. University societies, clubs, after school, in school, there's so much stuff to get involved with. Um, and if there isn't, make it that kind of entrepreneurial in, like innovation is what we need uh, to kind of have those voices heard all across the country. Um, the decision makers, that is a really, that is something that we touched on earlier. The only thing is that advocacy is currently tailored to decision makers. They want us to come to them. Um, the only thing that we can do about this is persistency and consistency of passionate, like campaigning on the issues that affect young people. That's really the only thing until the system is changed in essence. Uh, and youth work, my favourite topic of all time. I think that it kind of really comes back to what we were saying about earlier about how people that represent one demographic are often told to talk about that one demographic. I feel like as the chair of the Youth Parliament, I get wheeled out quite a lot to talk about youth work and its importance. But it's something that I'm really passionate about, so it does kind of field as well. Um, I've spoken a lot recently about youth work funding, how it's integral to um, our education system, about upskilling young people and making them um, the best version of themselves and to be able to contribute effectively to society, but also as a um, barrier um, like that... It, it, it engages so many young people when it's not there it um, allows young people to slip through the gaps and fall into poverty fall it, just become more disengaged with the overall political system youth work is underpinning a lot of the different things that um, we hold dear as a society in education poverty housing a lot of things that people don't necessarily see the connections with but the funding is absolutely it, it's imperative fantastic thank you uh, well, can I say to you all that uh, coming up at one o'clock in the Festival of Politics this afternoon, uh, Michael Pertillo, the former politician and broadcaster in conversation. Three o'clock, there's a, a discussion on uh, boys and men and gender-based violence. And then at uh, six o'clock, a uh, discussion about the future of Scotland's arts and culture. Um, immediately following this, there will be a, a survey you'll be invited to complete about the session, which we'd very much welcome you do. Uh, so can I finally then thank all of you for your participation, attendance, and ask you to thank our three panellists again. Thank you. Thank you.